The SHTF event we all prep for is what folks 150 years ago called daily life. No electrical power, no refrigerators, no internet, no computers, no TV, no hyperactive law enforcement, and no Safeway or Walmart. But they got things done, or else we wouldn't be here. In this short video, I'll unearth a long-forgotten secret that helped our ancestors survive famines, wars, economic crises, diseases, droughts, and anything else life threw at them. And a secret that will help you do the same for your loved ones when America crumbles into the ground. I'm also going to share with you three pioneer lessons that will ensure your children will be well-fed when others are rummaging through garbage bins. In fact, these three old teachings will improve your life immediately once you hear them. My name is Claude Davis, and you may know me from my website, askaprepper.com, or you may have seen my warnings in the media, but few of you know me personally. My story is emotionally heavy with struggles and disappointments, but also with faith in God and survival will that finally led to my being here. So pay close attention because this video will change your life forever, for the good. Lesson number one, don't take anything for granted. My grandparents from my father's side came to America from Ukraine just before the Second World War and started a small farm in Texas where I grew up without missing a thing. But my grandfather wasn't so lucky. When he was only 12 and still in Ukraine, he survived one of the most horrific famines. Of the hundred families that lived on his street, only 20 survived. So what you're about to hear is a real recollection as it was written in a personal journal just after the crisis by one of his neighbors. Where did all the bread disappear? I do not really know. Maybe they've taken it all abroad. The authorities have confiscated it, removed it from the villages, loaded grain into the railway coaches, and took it away someplace. They've searched the houses and taken away everything, to the smallest thing. All the vegetable gardens, all the cellars were raked out, and everything was taken away. It was so dreadful that every day became engraved in my memory. People were lying everywhere as dead flies. The stench was awful. Many of our neighbors and acquaintances from our street died. We tried to survive the best we could. We collected grass, goosefoot, burdocks, rotten potatoes, and made pancakes, soups from putrid beans or nettles, collected glay from the trees and ate it, ate sparrows, pigeons, cats, and dogs. When there were still cattle, it was eaten first, then the domestic animals. Some were eating their own children. I would never be able to eat my child. One of our neighbors came home when her husband, suffering from severe starvation, ate their own baby daughter. This woman went crazy. Another neighbor wrote a petition to the authorities, and here's just a paragraph from that. said, Please return the grain that you've confiscated from me. If you don't return it, I'll die. I'm 78 years old and I'm incapable of searching for food for myself. And, of course, nobody cared. In a crisis, it's everyone for himself. Although in many cases, families did still remain families. But just after the winter, when there's absolutely nothing to eat, my grandfather, together with his mother, went to the nearest town where the government had established a soup kitchen. Unfortunately, the 25-mile journey was too much for his mother. After just five miles, she couldn't walk anymore. My grandfather noted in his journal, Mother said, save yourself, run to town. I turned back twice. I could not bear to leave my mother, but she begged and cried, and I finally went for good. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'm a father myself, and when I read these things, I burst into tears. But please allow me to take a wild guess here, without getting mad at me. You're probably sitting in front of your computer right now with a few major worries. Maybe a half-full fridge, maybe a decent job, and at least a small backyard that you can hold on to, and that's all good. But make no mistake taking this for granted. History has shown us many times that it can all fly away in a split second. The biggest misstep that you can take now is to think that this can never happen in America or to you. All that my grandfather and our ancestors who came here and formed America lived through would be in vain without lesson number two. Those who cannot remember the past 
are condemned to repeat it. Now, call me old-fashioned, I don't care, but I completely believe in America and what our ancestors stood for. They all had a part in turning this land into one of the most powerful countries in the world. Many died and suffered before a creative mind found an ingenious solution to, maybe, a century-long problem. Now, believe it or not, our ancestors' skills are all covered in American blood. And this is why these must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same for our children and our children's children. But now, my friends, we're sitting on the edge of oblivion. Our fathers and grandfathers were probably the last generation to practice basic things like building a root cellar or making pemmican. Our ancestors laid the bricks and built the world's strongest foundation that we're about to irreversibly forget. And we're going to pay the ultimate price for this, because if you have a big, strong house with a weak foundation, it doesn't matter if it looks nice on the outside, the next flood will sweep it away. And that is exactly what will happen to most Americans in the coming crisis. So here we are, human beings in the 21st century, several lifetimes and a world away from our grandparents and their ways. Have we become better at living? I think not. I watch as we have become ever more expectant that the world owes us a living. Consumerism has reached epic proportions and people feel aggrieved if they don't own the latest gadget. The truth is, we never have been more disconnected from life, from the world, from the soil, from the trees, and from our own souls. We no longer know how to live without refrigerators, without cars, without phones, without supermarkets. So what will you do tomorrow you simply are unable to buy things? I sometimes think that we're kidding ourselves with our bug-out bags and with our three-day food rations. Wouldn't we be better off looking at what the pioneers took with them when they traveled from Independence, Missouri, all the way to Oregon City? That was a four- to six-month journey. And if your life depended on this, what bug-out bag would you take with you? I know I'd stick with whatever the pioneer had with him. He had to travel weeks on end without much help while taking cover from some native tribes at the same time. And this is just a small, tiny example. Guys, I don't want to see our forefathers' knowledge disappear into the darkness of time. And if you care about your family and what America stands for, then neither should you. This is the third and most important lesson of all. It's always up to you. Now, I believe in God and in the power of free will. And I believe that you are the only one in charge of your destiny and that you're constantly making decisions that shape the rest of your life. Now, it's true we all had different starts, depending on our families and upbringing, but for most of us here in the United States, we at least had decent beginnings. We had water and food, we could go shopping from time to time, and we had decent medical system compared to other countries. We should be more thankful for that. And we should ensure that we have something put aside for darker times. If anything goes wrong with this country, don't blame the government or the president. They don't truly care about you or your family. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but nothing just falls from the sky. God helps you. But he doesn't just lay it on your table. You have to work hard and do things yourself. As long as you're aware of this, your destiny rests solely on you and your willpower. Now, you can truly change things, and you can do a lot more than you think you can. With this idea in mind, five years ago, I wanted to do something that hasn't been done before. Something that not only would help me survive a crisis without investing a fortune in stockpiles, but something that I could do around my house on a daily basis using only methods that were tested and proven by our forefathers for centuries. I wanted to unearth and learn the forgotten ways of our great-grandparents. I went to my grandfather to find out how he survived and to learn the little secrets that helped him survive in spite of almost everyone else dying. Now, he was almost 90 years old, but the old man was still in good shape. For three weeks on end, I absorbed his lessons like a dry sponge. And on top of that, we built a lot of things together, including a root cellar and a storm shelter, just like the folks did when he was young. We made lard and ham, and we smoked four turkeys and preserved them for winter in four different traditional ways, and a lot, lot more. Now, when I was a child, I was raised by my grandparents, 
but I hadn't spent much quality time with him until then. In fact, there were months when we barely even spoke, not because we couldn't stand each other, but only because I was always too busy working or taking care of my kids. A lame excuse and a thing that I deeply regretted later on in life. But my grandfather passed on a couple of years ago, and with him, a magnificent amount of survival knowledge. Now, I don't know if you're in a similar situation, but think about your grandfather and how many things he did or knew, things that will vanish forever into the dark abyss of ignorance. And because I deeply believed in lesson number three, that I was the only one who could change something, my goal for the last couple of years changed from not just learning, but saving our forefathers' ways. This is one of the most important things I've done in my life, and I'm proud of it, but it took me five difficult years. Now, first, there's no person that knows all our forefathers' forgotten secrets. Let's just say there are still a handful of people that still practice a lost skill transmitted from generation to generation, even today. But not all the skills, of course. I had to get in touch with a lot of people. Second, where do you find these guys? They are no mainstream survival experts. They don't have a website or a TV show. And some of them even live in remote areas with no internet or TV cable, earning a living like the pioneers did. Third, I wanted to do something unprecedented. You know, articles like 11 skills your great-grandparents had that you didn't, and they started listing the skills. Hunting, fishing, foraging, butchering, and so on. Well, you know, this kind of information will never help anyone. I needed something solid, exact, and to the point. Not just skills, I wanted to know things that they actually built, ate, and stored, and exactly how they did it. And fourth, I'm not sitting on a gold mine. As much as I enjoyed traveling and learning these skills, I still needed to go to work. But what I didn't realize when I started my quest is that you can't save these skills only by writing them down. If all these writings will be forgotten in a dusty drawer right next to my bed, it won't help anyone. This knowledge will die together with me, and all my efforts to save our forefathers' ways would have been in vain. So this is because all my life I blindly believed in Lesson 3, that it's always up to me. But I was wrong. In this case, it's only halfway there. It's also up to you. Today is your chance to be a part of saving our ancestors' lost ways. I wanted to make this information available to every family out there without having to spend years of their lives or thousands of dollars. So I came up with this great idea to edit all my manuscripts and turn all this lost knowledge into one of the greatest books of this century. The Lost Ways, Saving Our Forefathers' Skills. Now, as you can see, I designed and edited the book in an old-fashioned way. But most of it is not written by me personally, because I didn't want people to read a second account. I'm sure a lot of information would have been lost in this process. You know, those little secrets that make a thing really work? Those little things that make a big difference. So I paid these experts for their time, and I got what I wanted. These people are not professional writers, but instead are uniquely special. They're neither the strong, badass type that you see in Rambo movies, nor the ultra-rich preppers from reality shows. They're simple people who know a lost skill very, very well. They're smart, shrewd, and wise enough to survive for months or even years in the world's most remote places. Now, here's a glimpse of what you'll find in The Lost Ways. Native American Eric Bainbridge, who was on the board of directors of a Native American educational and took part in the reconstruction of the native village of Kualoklo in California, will show you how Native Americans build the subterranean roundhouse, an underground house that today will serve you as a storm shelter, a perfectly camouflaged hideout, or a bunker. It can easily shelter three to four families. So how will you feel if, when all hell breaks loose, you'll be able to call all your loved ones and offer them guidance and shelter? And besides that, the subterranean roundhouse makes an awesome root cellar, where you can keep all your food and water reserves.